Né? E uma escola que até agora a gente consegue manter uma política do que os americanos chamam do blind admission, passou aqui, vai estudar. Né? A gente dá um jeito. Pode pagar, paga, não pode, a gente arruma uma bolsa de estudo, vários amigos apoiam esse projeto. Esse projeto só é viável porque tem uma comunidade que aposta nesse projeto. É um projeto de formar gente e de colaborar para dias como hoje. O debate, a troca de ideias, colaborar com a formação das pessoas e com o debate do país. É para isso que a gente está aqui. Costumo dizer que a gente tem um sonho pequeno, que é ajudar a mudar o Brasil. Né? E nada mais satisfatório do que ter uma palestra como a de hoje. Né? Acho que Michael Sandel dispensa apresentações. Aliás, os livros estão à venda ali fora. Né? É famoso pelo curso, pela sua produção intelectual. E talvez, sobretudo, para além disso, por ser um professor. Por estimular o debate, estimular a troca de ideias, a provocação ao diálogo, né? as perguntas, mais do que as respostas. Né? Trouxe temas muito relevantes para o debate, muito para além da filosofia e da economia, sobre, por exemplo, quais são os limites éticos dos mercados. Até onde devemos ir com os mercados, até onde não, onde não devemos ir. Né? Levantar a questão por si só é meritório. Trazer a ética para o debate é meritório. Trazer a ética para o debate do Brasil é muito mais que meritório. Né? Isso é um tema que certamente o país está carente e que precisa de uma profunda reflexão de como é que chegamos até aqui. Eu quero agradecer aqui o apoio para esse evento. Ele não seria possível, ele não seria viável, não fosse o apoio da Fundação Lehman, parceira da escola há tanto tempo, e do movimento Mapa Educação. E para fazer a apresentação de Michael Sandel, eu queria convidar aqui... O Renan, que é do Mapa é, Educação e aluno em Harvard, de Sandel, e Ana Laura, da Fundação Lema. E a vocês, e a todos vocês, muito obrigado. Que seja uma boa tarde. Obrigado a todos vocês. Boa tarde a todos. É um prazer ver a sala cheia, tantos rostos conhecidos. É, meu nome é Ana Laura, da Fundação Lehman, e a Fundação Lehman tem na sua missão o ajudar a melhorar a qualidade da educação no Brasil e também apoiar líderes que queiram ajudar a transformar o Brasil. E em parceria com o Mapa Educação, com o apoio do INSPER e da Ticket, que vai oferecer o nosso Coffee Break depois, é, para a gente é muito importante, muito gratificante poder proporcionar esse momento a vocês, de falar sobre ética, um tema tão importante, acho que nesse momento, no nosso país, e em qualquer momento, para quem quer ajudar a desenvolver lideranças que vão ter um impacto realmente significativo no Brasil para ajudar o país a se desenvolver, achamos um tema fundamental para ser tratado é, e muito feliz de ter vocês todos aqui para contemplar esse momento junto com a gente. Bom, sem mais delongas, o Renan para falar um pouco mais sobre o nosso convidado. Boa tarde a todos. Meu nome é Renan Ferreirinha, sou cofundador do movimento Mapa Educação, que é um movimento de 142 jovens em todos os estados brasileiros e pelo mundo todo, com o objetivo principal de transformar a educação, principal bandeira do Brasil nos próximos anos, e fazer dos jovens protagonistas do mesmo. E é uma grande honra estar aqui com todos vocês, casa cheia. É, quando eu disse para o professor Sandel, no semestre passado, que eu queria trazer ele para o Brasil... Ele falou que já tinha vindo aqui quatro vezes, mas nunca para falar para a massa. E ele já falou no Complexo Alemão, falou no Rio de Janeiro, falou ontem no Caldeirão do Hulk, e hoje está falando aqui no INSPIA também para uma massa. Então é uma grande honra. O professor Sandel é o professor mais popular do mundo, considerado por alguns lugares, certamente o mais popular de Harvard, da aula de filosofia e ética. Seus livros já venderam mais de milhões de unidades ao redor de vários países. E vai ser, uma grande, vai ser um grande prazer criar essa relação Brasil-Michael Sandel, Brasil ética, Brasil filosofia de maneira mais assídua. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, Professor. Welcome to São Paulo. Welcome to Winsper. The show now is yours. Well, thank you all for welcoming me here at INSPIR. It's really a great 
privilege for me to be here with you. And you even, you are so hospitable that you even arranged for my visit an unusual historic political event. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes me worried what might happen the next time I visit. <laughs> I actually, before I decided to become an academic, I thought I might like to be a political journalist. And when I was in the university, I worked as a political journalist one summer in Washington for a newspaper. The summer was the summer of 1974, uh, which meant I got to cover the congressional hearings about the impeachment of Richard Nixon. And so I feel like I've been returned to my youth. <laughs> this is my third day on this trip to Brazil. And the three days, though I've, I've been here, I think this is my fifth visit to Brazil, but these three days have been, for me, a remarkable educational experience. Just when I arrived two days ago, I had the opportunity to, uh, in Rio, to go to the Complexo de Alemão and engage in a dialogue with uh, members of the community there to discuss the questions, the, the big ethical questions they confront in their everyday life, ethical and also political questions. We talked about violence, about injustice. We had a, a dialogue about the relation between violence and injustice, and also freedom, and what it means to be a citizen, and how it's possible, or whether it's possible, for the voices of citizens, especially people who live in very difficult circumstances, whether it's possible for their voices to be heard in democracy. The discussion I had in the favela, I would almost call it, a, it was a, a discussion of philosophy in a favela that was very powerful and their voices were very eloquent um, and also very much open to the big philosophical questions of justice and freedom and citizenship and the meaning of democracy. And then the next day, yesterday in Rio, I had the opportunity to participate in another kind of dialogue. This was organized by Luciano um, Hawk in his television program where he assembled people from, uh, in a studio from across the country, from around Brazil, from very different social backgrounds. There were lawyers, and there were housekeepers, and there were cooks, and there was a police officer, and there was a woman who picks up trash, and, and there were uh, some academics. People from very different social backgrounds and walks of life. And there, too, we had a dialogue about ethics. And to, we began with the ethics of everyday life. And we explored the phenomenon of Jechino Brasileiro. <laughs> and we asked, first I was trying to understand more fully what this really means. They gave me many examples ranging from avoiding various creative strategies to avoid the lay seca police, <laughs> uh, to ways of dealing with the problem of a very long line uh, for, let's say, a soccer match, or at the bank, or at the supermarket. And as best I understood, what Jechinu really means 
Well, it seems to mean two things. One is a creative way of dealing with the obstacles to getting things done, especially where those obstacles may be created by a bureaucratic, an unresponsive bureaucracy. But it also involves, sometimes, I at least as I understood it, taking, taking advantage of other people, sometimes cheating, sometimes bribing a policeman to avoid getting a ticket, or hiring, if you see a roadblock, going on social media to find out where the roadblock will be, or stopping your car and paying someone, a cab driver or a friend, to drive your car through. I had never heard about some of these techniques <laughs> before. And I also heard about strategies for getting to the head of a long line if you go to see the Flamenco soccer team play and you're not sure you'll get a ticket. Going up toward the front of the line, finding a friend or maybe a distant acquaintance and engaging in conversation and joining the line. Now, we discussed which of these practices are ethical, which are unethical. So it was an ethical dialogue. But one thing that struck me listening to this discussion and hearing about these examples is that these small acts of trying to deal with the problems of everyday life in informal ways have been replaced by a more impersonal mechanism of achieving the same thing by the growing use, at least in many uh, democratic capitalist societies, by the growing use of markets of paying money. Let me give you one example. Take the paying, take the bribe of a police officer. Now most people would agree that's wrong, that's unethical. If you're stopped for drunk driving or if you're stopped for speeding, to bribe the police officer, that's unethical. Probably everyone here would agree with that. But what exactly is a bribe? And is there a difference between a bribe and a cash incentive? Now, when you offer the police officer a bribe, you are giving him an incentive. It's a cash incentive. And yet we think of cash incentives as the way that markets achieve the common good. I can think of one extreme example of this, there was a candidate in Nevada, in the US, running for governor. And he had an interesting solution to a, the budget deficit. He said, on the open roads of Nevada, there's a speed limit. And if you speed, if you exceed the speed limit and are caught, you have to pay a fine. But we could raise a lot of money by giving, by selling, to people who want to speed by selling them a permit, a speeding permit, for 24 hours. And so for the payment of, say, $75 or $100, you could get the right to speed for that day. And it would enter, you would have a transponder on your car, and if a police officer were about to arrest you, the transponder would send a message saying that for this 24 hours, he's, he's bought the right to speed. Now, that's $75. In the end, it wasn't, it was rejected, this proposal, and the candidate lost. <laughs> but it raises an interesting philosophical question. Is there a difference between the fee for speeding and the fine if you're caught. And for that matter, is there a difference between the fee for speeding 
and the bribe to a police officer if you're caught? Or would you say that creating that fee is allowing people to bribe their way to breaking the speed limit? What exactly is a bribe and what's a fee or a cash incentive? Or take the example of cutting in line, jumping to the head of the queue. Routinely now, in market societies, the right to jump to the head of the queue is not, not an informal matter, but it's bought and sold. So consider the airports, at many airports, if you buy an expensive ticket, you get to go in a fast track lane. In many amusement parks around the world, if you don't like standing in long lines, you can pay extra for a VIP or a fast track ticket and jump to the head of the queue. Now, if the amusement park offers this as a service, you might say, well, they're just asking you to pay, allowing you to pay more for faster service a premium experience. But if it's wrong to jump the queue, or if it's wrong to hire a friend to stand in the line for you, why is it different if you are sold the right to jump to the head of the queue by paying money in advance? One practice that raises this question is there are now line standing companies, uh, some of them in Washington, D.C., that will hire, if you want to attend, say, a congressional hearing, but don't want to stand in a long line, maybe overnight, you can go to the company, pay them a certain amount of money, and they will hire a homeless person to wait in the line for you. And you, at, as the hearing begins, you go and you take the place of the homeless person, he or she has been paid, and you take a seat in the front row. They also, until recently, allowed paid line standing if outside the US Supreme Court. Now, uh, there's another example I encountered a few years ago. In Beijing hospitals, which are very good hospitals, there are long lines for doctor's appointments. People come from many of them from the rural areas, and they line up for days at a time to get an appointment ticket. The appointment tickets are given out in the morning. They're very cheap. They're priced below the market price. When all the tickets are handed out for the day, the window closes. But there is now a business. Entrepreneurs hire line standers to wait in the line to get the appointment ticket and then they resell it at a high price to people willing and able to pay. Now, take these different ways of getting to the head of the line. Some informal, others built into the price of the amusement park, and still others involving hiring a person to stand in line for you. Are they really morally different or do they have something in common? The general point this raises. And if this Can we turn? Okay. The, the general point this raises is we hear a lot of discussion about corruption, especially in recent weeks and months, about corruption and bribes. And when we think of corruption and bribes, we think of payoffs uh, to government officials, to political parties, to get contracts. These are familiar kinds of corruption and bribery. But what we don't often reflect on is what actually constitutes a bribe and what's the difference, morally speaking, between a bribe and a legitimate cash incentive? That's a question I'd like to discuss with you today. Now, do we have, uh, we have microphones for the audience and people on both? 
on both um, aisles. Thanks. So let's take a couple, one or two hard cases to explore this question about the, the role of, of cash incentives. Beginning with an example to do with environmental protection and global warming. During global environmental conventions and debates, everybody agrees it would be a good thing to reduce carbon emissions. The question, the hard question is, how to allocate the responsibilities for reducing carbon emissions to countries around the world. And there are sharp debates, including between some developing countries in the developed world, about who should bear the burden, who should bear the cost of reducing carbon emissions. Some developed countries, including the US, have insisted that any allocation of targets or quotas for emission, carbon emission reductions should include the following market provision. A country should be able, once the quotas are set for emissions reductions, country by country, a country should be able to fulfill its obligations in one of two ways, either by reducing its own carbon emissions to the required level, or by paying some other country to reduce its emissions to a similar degree. So the argument in favor of this idea of tradable emissions credits is a standard argument of economic efficiency. Let's say for the US it would be very costly to meet its carbon reduction target through reductions of its own. The US would be able to, let's say, retire to all of the kerosene lamps in India, which emit a lot of carbon, and replace them with more energy efficient forms of lighting and heating and, and cooking. So if it's cheaper for the United States, this is the efficiency argument. If it's cheaper for the United States to achieve this reduction by paying some other country to reduce its carbon emissions, from the standpoint of the heavens, the overall global warming, that should be a perfectly acceptable alternative. But others resist this idea. Others are bothered by it. So I'd like to begin by just taking a survey, a vote in this room to see what you think, to see how many are in favor and how many are against tradable pollution permits, which is one way of describing this scheme. How many would be in favor? And how many would be against? Well, close to, and the, the majority I think are in favor, but a sizable minority are against. So let's begin with the, those of you who just voted against. What, what's wrong with it? What would be your reason for opposing this, notwithstanding the efficiency argument in its favor? What do you think? Go ahead. Do you want to stand up and tell us what you think? Go ahead. And you can speak in Portuguese or in English, as you wish. Eu acho que o é errado isso, porque o desenvolvimento econômico de um país está completamente ligado à consequência ambiental que ele causa ao planeta. Na medida em que um um país vai pagar o outro para diminuir os efeitos ecológicos, ele está inferindo diretamente no desenvolvimento econômico desse país. Ele está tentando mascarar um efeito, mas sem resolver a causa. 
Although the, the developed country, the developed country that accepts the funds will presumably benefit by the funds and that may contribute to its being able to afford more energy efficient sources of energy. Why does that hurt a developing country if they choose to accept the money to achieve reductions in their carbon emissions? É porque na, no momento em que ele paga um país, ele torna esse país dependente economicamente dessa verba. E ele impede que ele desenvolva uma indústria própria e toda uma, uma produção própria que acabaria é, causando danos ao meio ambiente. Ok, thank you. And what do you say? Uh, yeah, I would. I could argue that everything is connected, and at some point, your capability of buying from somewhere else would end, and you have to start doing it yourself. So, if everybody does it, its piece, the synergy is better. I think you can explore the others as much as you want, or buy from others, but at some point, this will end, right? Maybe or maybe not. Maybe there will always be efficiencies, greater efficiencies, in paying for emissions reductions elsewhere. What would be wrong with that? Does anyone have an objection in principle to that approach? Yes. Uh, just to confirm your assumption, you're saying that um, one country uh, is connected to the other worldwide, so uh, the damage is globally, is not in one country specifically. Like right, we're assuming that we're trying to reduce carbon emissions globally right. to, for the sake of reduce the, the uh, climate change effects. So it doesn't matter for what purpose, from where the uh, carbon comes or from where the emissions come. So there's an objection in principle to this. Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, for me, the idea of the proposal of uh, diminishing uh, carbon in the countries is to change the habits of the people who live there. So in the medium run, it won't be necessary to sell credits if you change the mentality of people in countries. And so y you worry that selling the credits will avoid or prevent the rich countries from changing their own habits, and that's one of the goals of this yes. purpose. And what's your name? Uh, Luis. Luis. All right. Of those, so Luis worries that the goal here, there are really two goals. Tell me if I have this right, Luis. Reducing the carbon emissions and, at least over time, cultivating certain habits and attitudes toward the environment and allowing countries to buy their way out of emissions reductions will, I suppose, corrupt their habits and attitudes by making pollution a kind of luxury good that they can afford. Luis, right? Okay. So who, now who voted on the other side and has a reply to Luis? Yes. Well, I was very resistant in terms of deciding whether I'm against or in favor, yeah. because in my opinion, it really depends on the cap you put for the, for the, for right, the, for the carbon, for the carbon targets, because if you put a cap too low, then it's going to, the cost is going to be very prohibited for poor countries to buy the, the license right. to emit. And if it's too high, it doesn't make any sense because right. rich countries will continue to emit, emit more okay. and more. That's so a serious, it depends okay, whether you establish That's a serious question, but that's also a hard question, even if you don't allow the buying and selling, where to set the cap. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, who has a defense? Who wants to defend tradable pollution permits against Luis's objection. 
I think this is more of a moral question than an ethic. I think this question is more a morality question than an ethical question, because if you put it like uh, we have established a cap and we know that if all the world does a bit more carbon dioxide than that, we'll be okay, then there will be no harm to anyone uh, if the, the carbon emissions are traded. And it could actually be good for the countries that are developing because now they have more than just the option of uh, having to develop industries. They can also not develop those industries and get money and then possibly in the future invest that in tourism as is the case with Costa Rica or Bhutan. And that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. Um, and it's a morality question more or less because of the reason that Luis was saying. Uh, you think that, well, but we can try to um, make people focus on better ways of, uh, of progress, of development, by restricting their possibilities. So okay, and what's your name? Rodrigo. Rodrigo. Uh, let me, may I ask you a follow-up question, Rodrigo? Now, this, take, take another, a simpler example, just involving one person, not, whole, not a country or a group of countries. Suppose, uh, take, take the laws against littering, against throwing beer cans mm -hmm. out the window when you're driving in a car onto the highway or on a beach. Now let's suppose that to enforce this prohibition on littering, there's a fine. What, what would the fine be? You're asking me for a value? No, well, what is the fine today, the roughly, for throwing a beer can a, on the, I, there's no fine. <laughs> there is? How much is it? F 50 highs. So uh, it's interesting that there's, we were, I thought there'd be disagreement on the ethical questions. Here's a disagreement on the factual question <laughs> about whether, they, whether there is a law against littering. That's interesting in its own right. But all right, let's suppose there is a fine of 50 years for throwing a beer can mm -hmm. on the beach yeah. or on the road. And suppose there is a person who has a beer can and has plenty of money and can't see an easy place, uh, can't find a, a garbage bin, and so says, I'm going to throw it on the beach or on the road and I will simply pay, it's worth it to me, I will simply pay the 50 heyas. It's worth it to me to be able to get rid of this. Mm -hmm. And let's suppose the, the amount of money is enough to hire someone to go and pick it up, and clean it up. So you pay the fine, you go, we'll imagine it's you. Okay. You, pay, you throw the can, uh -huh. you pay the fine, someone is hired, paid to go and clean it up. Mm -hmm. Have you done anything wrong, do you think? No, I don't think I've done anything wrong. Because? Because I've paid the money to the public right. uh, agency that is responsible for cleaning it up later. Right, and someone is hired and mm -hmm. gets a job. Yeah. And they clean it up. Right. So you've not damaged the environment at all? And you've provided employment for somebody. Well, I, assu assumed, I assumed the price, the fine of 50 reais, was evaluated at a cost yeah. that would compensate for right. the damage in the environment okay. that it caused. Okay, we're assuming that's true. And, okay, yes. all right, so this gets to the heart of the issue. So Rodrigo says, he pays the fine, the beer can is cleaned up, the environment is as it was before, and someone has a job, so he's done nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. That's pretty strong logic. Is there anyone who disagrees with Rodrigo? Wow, a lot of people disagree. Here, Professor. Okay. Here. So why why do you disagree? Go ahead. Re yeah. Uh, yes. Again. No. Okay. Okay. Well, go ahead and let let, let her. Did you speak already? Uh, no, I did not. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, you're asking go, go me. Ahead. I'm why sorry. do I disagree? Yeah. Well, because you are like incentivizing people to have like a behavior that 
in the long run, and if it, it amounts to half of the population throwing can, there's a point that you are like internalizing the costs of like cleaning. Uh, you could be using that with other things that the society needs. And so you create an amount, a, a trend that there's no control over a certain time. I mean, there's a limit that you can just invest just in cleaning the city. Rodrigo, a reply. Well, you can't predict that. You can't predict how much an action like that will make other people throw litter on the... No, I well, take a look around Sao Paulo, maybe you have <laughs> some well, insights I, on that. I would, I will agree. I will agree that there is a psychological effect that has been studied. Like, if you are in a neighborhood that is dirty, then people are more likely to commit crimes and things like that. Yeah. But you can't really say that if you've done something, then uh, it will cause other people to do this bad behavior. But wait, 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 assuming that Rodrigo, I th I, you have a stronger reply. To, what's your name? Michelle. Michelle? Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say, even if it does lead other people to emulate you, if they also are paying the 50 highs, they are also providing more employment, and they are also having no net bad effect on the environment. That's what? true. Yes, okay. I agree. <laughs> so, that's, so that's what... So that's what Rodrigo wants to say to you, Michelle. <laughs> what do you say to that argument? In my view, it's, a, uh, it's re related to opportunity cost. You're choosing to invest your money in buying your, uh, opportunity cost to throw litter. I'm I prefer for to use service. my money to yeah. do something else instead okay. of buying my right to throw okay, the Okay, but then you don't have to throw your beer can. No, Rodrigo I'm, wants to throw his. All right. Yeah. Let's, so, and in the back, behind. Thank you, thank you for that. Go ahead. What do Me? you think? No? Yeah. Yes. I, I don't speak English very ahead, well, so. Speak uh, in Portuguese. Okay. Uh, well, uh, na verdade, o que você está fazendo é comprar uh, o seu direito de uh, estragar o meio ambiente. Só que você não está pensando na coletividade. Você está pensando no seu direito individual de fazer o que você bem entende, pagando. Mesmo que esteja dentro da lei, nem sempre a lei é justa, nem sempre a lei está uh, preocupada em agradar uh, uma coletividade. Às vezes ela está preocupada em atender a interesses individuais. I, I think that a good measure for ethics is like, what if everyone else did this, do the same? Okay. Yeah. So, if everyone uh, threw litter in the streets yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and pay for someone else, yeah, there would be no one else to 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 get it for them. So, uh, streets would be all covered in litter and stuff. And but also why why don't you assume more people would have jobs? It would become maybe the the because greatest source of employment be, be, in the country. It's be, because it, if everyone else uh, did the same, it would be a culture of throwing litter and paying for it, and that's not sustainable. You know, it's not sustainable or it's ethically objectionable. Which? Oh, both. But why is it ethically objectionable? Well, b because because. Uh, um, if if, if every, everybody threw litter and pay for someone else, there will be no one else to, to get the litter for them because it's not part of culture to get litter from the street, you know, so the... But if you're paid, it yeah. may not be part of the culture to avoid throwing beer but, cans, but if you're paid, mm -hmm. the culture would be you get paid to pick up litter. So you wouldn't pay in the first place. Go ahead, what do you say? I, I would like to add two things. I think there's a... Uh, an issue with money because not everyone's going to be able to pay so it seems unfair that people who do not have 50 reais to afford paying for trash are never going to be able to engage in that behavior and that seems <laughs> like it's going to separate people who can pay and who cannot in an unfair way in my way of thinking yeah. and the other issue is that there is a value to arriving at the beach or at the road and finding it clean in the first place of having a hundred people picking up trash because it's dirty. <laughs> I so I think as a society, there is a value in that and that's why um, it doesn't seem right. 
Okay, we've got, if you listen closely to this debate, there are two objections to the efficiency argument which Rodrigo presented and defended. One objection is, what's your name? What, the, what Flavia raised, which is it's unfair if only the rich can afford to throw beer cans but not the poor. That's an argument about inequality and fairness. Now, I suppose if you thought that were the only problem, ethically, you could provide public subsidies or scholarships <laughs> <laughs> for those who can't afford it. But there is a further objection, if you listen to these arguments, which goes beyond the consideration of fairness and inequality, and that has to do with the cultivation of certain habits and attitudes about the environment or about the landscape being free of litter, so that even if Rodrigo did pay enough to hire someone quickly to clean up the litter, that it would be cultivating bad attitudes to say that there's nothing wrong with littering. We don't have a fine for littering. We only have a fee. This raises the distinction between a fine and a fee. And Luis, who spoke about, you raised, where is Luis? Now, you raised the objection about habits and attitudes toward the environment when you were arguing against tradable pollution permits. What uh, do you see an analogy between the debate we've had about the fee for littering and your argument about cultivating the right kinds of habits and attitudes toward the, uh, toward the planet? Uh, yes, uh, because in, in our model of society, we should determine what are the habits we'd like to keep and what are the habits we'd like to change. And the habit of throwing trash on the street is definitely, for me, a habit you wouldn't like to be the formation of your mentality. And that's not only Rodrigo's going to say, yeah, but he's still going to clean it up. He's paid to clean it up. But it seems that you think there are two ethical issues at stake. The consequences for the beer cans on the beach or the carbon in the atmosphere, the consequences, but also the character of the society and of the citizens. And you think that in deciding whether to buy and sell the right to pollute or to litter, we have to consider both. Do I have it right? Yes. OK, so there do seem to be these two separate issues. It comes up. It comes up all the time if you're looking for this distinction between a fine, which registers society's disapproval, and a fee, which is just a cost of doing business. Um, about a year ago, I went to visit my son, who is a graduate student, studying chimpanzees in the wild in Uganda. And while I was visiting him, we went on a, uh, we visited a national park in Uganda. To, to see animals. And it's sometimes hard to see animals, especially the really dramatic ones like lions. It's a great achievement to spot one. And we were riding along. There was a, a driver of this four-wheel drive vehicle. And we came to a sign that said, off-road driving prohibited fine $200. And the driver, the African driver of the vehicle, looked at that sign and said, oh, what that sign really says is that off-road driving is permitted. It just costs $200. Now, was, was he right or was he missing something? Maybe he was being ironic. But if he was being ironic, or if he was actually making, uh, giving a moral interpretation of that rule, he, as in the littering case, well, he actually, uh, Rodrigo, uh, took your position, took your position, that this is really a price 
though it's announced as a prohibition, $200 is the price for driving off the road into the national park. Did you want to say one more thing about yeah. that? Um, one thing is that um, when the people, this moralist view that you're cultivating a bad habit is missing to see the entire habit that this person has. First, uh, this person has a good habit of getting rich to pay the fines. And then <laughs> it has also the good character of immediately paying the fine and, and saying like, look, I've thrown something here and I'm giving the money for that. Okay. It's not like it's committed the crime and then tried to hide it. All right, so this is an ingenious uh, turn to the argument. But what's interesting here is that Rodrigo has, is now not relying only on the efficiency argument, the consequences. He's trying to take on and accept the premise of the argument from character and habits and attitudes and norms and trying to show actually some desirable qualities of character, some desirable attitudes might be cultivated by allowing this system. I want to thank everyone who's joined in this first part of the discussion. Thank you all for that. What, but even if, whether Rodrigo is right or wrong about those qualities of character, the willingness to hire someone and so on, it's still clear that in order to decide when to use a market mechanism and when it may do more harm than good, it's not enough simply to ask what are the consequences, what are the economic consequences, what are the efficiency effects. It's also necessary to debate, and it may be debatable, but it's also necessary to debate what attitudes, what habits, what qualities of character, civic character and character of the society will be encouraged or promoted by using this market mechanism. Now, in Europe today, they are struggling with the question of refugees. And countries, some countries, are very resistant to accepting any refugees or very many refugees. The European Union has proposed a quota system whereby countries would be assigned a certain number of refugees they had to accept. Some have proposed that one way of persuading countries to accept more aggressive targets, more refugees, is to give countries a choice that they can, fill their, they can fulfill their duty to accept their quota of refugees, either by taking that number of refugees or by paying some other country to accept them. It's the same principle, the same issue. Now, in the light of the discussion we've had against tradable emissions credits, let's see what people think about tradable refugee quotas. How many would be in favor? How many would be against? So here, more there seems a stronger sentiment against. Who will quickly give us a reason for objecting? Those of you who are against, why, why are you against? Yes. I think that um, I don't know. I just see that as morally and ethically wrong because you are turning the refugees into a market, and that's just I don't know bizarre, and it's disrespectful, like to the human rights and the human essence at itself. So I think it's kind of bizarre in that sense. It's bizarre, and it's turning the refugee into a kind of product or commodity. Yes. And you think it's dehumanizing. Yes, and I also believe that I don't know. It kind of. Um, I don't know, it it doesn't really um falling in Portuguese que eu dei uma travada. Okay. I'll get <laughs> the, go no, ahead. You can speak que... in Portuguese. Go ahead. 
Ah, é que eu acho que a questão é que também foge um pouco assim da seriedade da questão dos refugiados. Então, quando você coloca eles como mercadorias, é, você está ignorando toda a questão que está por trás. Então, acho que isso é muito problemático. É bem mais complexo do que isso. Então. Ok. All right. Now, who quickly on the other side? Uh, who can give a reply? What's your name? Olivia. Olivia. Who disagrees with Olivia? Who thinks? If it gives more refugees, if it, if it leads countries to accept Professor. stronger quotas, do you have an answer to Olivia? Professor, I uh, want to hear an answer. Yes? I, I'm sorry if I'm being impolite, but I would like to contribute to the last topic because I try to. Well, let's. let's I, think, I, I want to so it, move very, on. It's very, right, important quickly, because quickly. it's very important because I'm from a state in Brazil, yeah. called Amapá. I don't know if most of Brazilian people know, but in Cape Town Conference, uh, uh, most of you have heard the Cape Town uh, Environmental Conference. Yeah. We uh, was decided that Amapá could be uh, the guardian of the Amazon. So we have 70% of our land yeah. uh, untouchable, so we can do nothing. Uh, we can develop industries or factories or, or yeah. what else we want. So. I do think we we have the the right to receive for this. Uh -huh. uh, we, we as uh, people who live in Amazon, right. we can't think in, in to get some compensation from I, the community as a whole. I, I the do believe as a whole. I, I do believe in this. Okay, thank you for that. Now on the on the question about whether the refugee quotas dehumanize or commodify people, who disagrees with that? Yes, back. No, no, behind. Yeah. I think about it more like an economic view. I mean, some countries need labor. Some other countries don't need the labor from immigrants. I mean, if it's like uh, countries are obligated to accept immigrants, it's like an uh, inefficiency in economics. Right. And by if the, time, the quotas are not tradable, it's inefficient. Yeah, exactly. It's inefficient. By the time the quotas are tradable, it gets to the countries who need labor from immigrants. Right. They may find it a bargain. They get money and they get labor. Exactly. And they should be able to make that choice. And that's economic and they're better off. efficiency. They're better off. And the countries who sell the immigrants, who don't want to take in so many, or the refugees, they're better off. Can you repeat that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just restating the efficiency yeah, argument. Exactly. Both, That's both exactly right countries. Right. They both benefit. From they this. both benefit. And what's your name? Thomas. 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 Yeah. So, uh, who? All right. So, uh, but what about the argument, Thomas, that Olivia made, that you achieve these efficiency effects at the pro at the cost of commodifying or dehumanizing the the people. The refugees. I don't think it's dehumanizing. I mean, of course, there are people, they have the rights, but uh, they would be in a very, how can I say, in a bad position of being in a country that wouldn't like to accept them, that in a country that has the money and uh, labor demand for them. Right. And the country that buys them, by definition, wants them. Or needs them. <laughs> yeah. or need. more, more, not like, not like okay. once they need All right. for economic development. Okay, thank you for that. What, what this, even, even this brief debate brings out, is a parallel to the first part of the discussion about carbon emissions and about tossing beer cans, which is that in order to decide whether to use, well, let me say that again. From the standpoint of economic efficiency arguments, like the one Tomas makes, the only question that needs to be asked in deciding whether to use a market mechanism, whether to make a quota tradable, is whether it will have desirable efficiency effects, whether the overall consequences will be better, whether both parties to the deal are better off. But another view, the view represented here by Olivia's argument, says that's not the only consideration. We also have to ask whether the market mechanism, the tradable feature of the quota itself, may 
change our view of the refugees, may cultivate bad attitudes toward refugees. To put it in a slightly different language, Olivia, you're saying, if I understand you, that there might be something corrupting about this buying and selling of refugee quotas. And what's being corrupted here seems to be, if the argument is right, seems to be the proper way of regarding and treating refugees, not as objects of barter or sources of profit, but as human beings in need. Is that a fair statement of the view lying behind your yeah. objection? OK. So what's interesting here are two things. First, that there are these two separate arguments, one about efficiency and consequences, the other about attitudes, values, and character. And the second interesting thing is the arguments about attitudes and habits are, can, can often, maybe always be described as a worry about corruption. But in this case, corruption has a broader meaning than public officials taking payoffs from companies. What well, the corruption objection to cash incentives or tradable permits consists in is the idea that certain attitudes, certain values are corrupted or degraded if treated as market goods. And if that's right, then to decide where markets serve the public good and where they don't belong, we have to engage in both debates, debates about economic efficiency, but also debates about the right way of valuing goods and social practices. Let me give you, let me tell you one story. It actually was the subject of a piece of economics research. There are some, there were some daycare centers, kindergartens in Israel that faced a familiar problem. Parents coming late to pick up their children. So with the help of some economists, the kindergarten established a fine for parents who came late. What do you suppose was the result? More parents came late. Now, it's an interesting question why this happened. From the standpoint of standard price theory, standard economic analysis. If you put a price on something, or if you increase the price of something, fewer people rather than more people will do that thing. But here, more parents came late. Why? Why do you think? The guilt was off. Yeah, before parents who came late felt guilty. They were imposing on the teachers who had to stay late. But now that there was a fine, well, the parents seem to treat the fine as if it were a fee. Yeah. Just like my driver in the Ugandan forest regarded the fine as if it were a fee. And if it were a fee, it would be like hiring a babysitter to look after your child. And why feel guilty if you're paying the babysitter? It's a fee. Just as Rodrigo doesn't feel guilty if he's hiring a person to clean up the beer can. If it's a fee, it's a monetary payment, why feel guilty? What's interesting about this case is when they discovered that more parents came late, they removed the fine. <laughs> but the new level of late arrivals persisted, which suggests that once attitudes and norms, the sense of guilt, are crowded out, or corrupted by a market mechanism, they're not so easy simply to restore, as if flipping on a switch, to turn them back on again. There was another experiment done by the same economists. Every year, there, there was a, an activity where high school students went door to door <coughs> collecting funds for charitable causes. One year, the economists divided these high school kids 
into three groups. The first group was given a short motivational speech about the importance of the charities and sent on their way. The second group was given the same speech and offered a 1% commission on all the funds they raised. The third group was given the same speech, but they were offered a 10% commission. Now, which group do you think raised the most money for charity? What do you guess? Some say the third. Some, many are saying the first. Someone said the second. It was the first. The group that received no commission raised the most money. Standard price theory did, was vindicated to this extent. Those who were offered a 10% commission did raise more than those offered a 1% commission. But those who were offered no money at all raised more even than the 10% group. Now, here again, from the standpoint of price theory, this is an anomaly. It's a paradox. How to explain it? Well, following on the example of the late arriving parents, it seems that introducing the commission, the monetary payment, though it, it was a cash incentive, changed the meaning of the activity. What had become a charitable civic project now became a deal, a financial transaction, a kind of job. And the effect of the cash incentive was not simply to add one incentive, a monetary incentive, on the charitable moral incentive. It was actually to undermine, or you might say to corrupt, the intrinsic motivation to raise money for these charitable causes. What is the moral of the story of these examples and of the discussions we've had about the emissions credits, about the refugee, tradable refugee quotas, about the beer can. The moral of the story, I think, is this, that in order to decide when to use market mechanisms and cash incentives, we have to ask not only about efficiency, but also, well, about fairness, and about corruption. Will the monetary incentive change the meaning of the activity and crowd out the intrinsic motivations that lead parents to show up on time or lead people not to throw beer cans out of their car? And to figure that out, we have to decide what ways of valuing goods and social practices, whether it's refugees or care for the planet, what attitudes and habits and qualities of civic character are worthy of cultivating with regard to this or that social practice, whether it's education or the environment or civic life or politics. A second implication, a second moral of the story, takes us back to politics and to democratic politics. Not only in Brazil, but in countries around the world today, there is tremendous frustration with politics, with politicians, and with established political parties. Citizens don't feel they have a voice, they don't trust established political parties or politicians. And what's, I think, the deepest source of frustration in democracies around the world is that people realize that the terms of public discourse are empty. They're hollow of, of big questions, of larger moral meaning. What passes for political discourse these days in most democratic societies is either narrow technocratic talk, which inspires no one, or when passion does enter, shouting matches, where politicians are shouting past one another without listening to one another or engaging in debate about big questions that matter. 
I think people are rightly frustrated with the terms of public discourse that leave little room for substantive engagement with big moral questions, including questions about justice, about the role of money in markets in our societies, about equality and inequality, about what it means to be a citizen, about what it means to seek for the common good. People want politics to be about big things, including big questions about values. It's not easy to find a way to elevate the terms of public discourse in a way that addresses controversial ethical questions. The moment we suggest, as Luis is suggesting, and Olivia, that we bring questions about the right attitudes, the right habits to cultivate morally into public life, we know there will be disagreement. We disagree about ethical questions in pluralist societies. And so there's the temptation to think that we should avoid engaging with moral and spiritual questions in public life. There's the temptation to ask citizens to leave their moral and spiritual convictions outside when they enter the public square. But this, I think, is a mistake. It's a mistake because the biggest questions we face don't admit of morally neutral solutions. It's also a mistake because it, it hollows out public discourse. It leaves citizens disempowered and frustrated. And sooner or later, if that empty space isn't filled by pluralist voices arguing about ethics and justice and the common good, if that space isn't filled by pluralist voices, it will be filled, more likely than not, by narrow, intolerant voices who offer certain answers to those questions. And we see this, this danger beginning to unfold in democratic societies around the world. We see it with the success of Donald Trump in the United States. We see it with the success of Marine Le Pen, the National Front, in France and in other countries throughout Europe. So, so there are at least two reasons to aspire to a form of public discourse that engages more directly with big ethical questions. One is, it's dangerous if we don't. But the other is a more positive reason a more robust, morally engaged public discourse will not lead to agreement on every question, but it will lead, it can potentially lead, to a richer, more satisfying democratic life. And it can also be, it can make public life a kind of education that cultivates civic attitudes and habits that makes all of us individually, but also collectively, better democratic citizens. Thank you very much. A gente queria só em nome do INSPER e da Fundação. A gente queria só em nome do INSPER e da Fundação Lehmann e do Mapa da Educação agradecer a generosidade do professor Sandel, que veio nessa semana histórica para o Brasil, dividir com a gente com tanta generosidade. E o que ele tem falado para a gente é que o debate ético no Brasil precisa ficar mais fortalecido. Tem debate de crise econômica, mas tem um pouco, pouco debate de ética aqui. Então, a gente queria agradecer mais uma vez a presença do professor chamá-las para um debate que vai acontecer no Mapa da Educação, agora na João Cachoeira, número 960, com o Cláudio Haddad e outras pessoas muito relevantes. 
e avisar a pedido do professor que os livros dele estão à venda aqui na porta, na saída do auditório. Muito obrigada.